Good evening, <coughs> friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> well, I, uh, I happen to be the person running the institute, and it's my great pleasure to chair this uh, public lecture by uh, Professor Paul and Brett. Well, uh, public lectures, as you know, this is a public lecture. Public lectures are part of the outreach activities of the uh, NUS Institute for Mathematical Sciences. This evening's public lecture is jointly organized by the Institute for Medical Sciences and the Risk Management Institute. <coughs> we are honored to have Professor Paul Embrex as our speaker. Professor Embrex is Professor of Mathematics and Director of Risk Lab at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology at Zurich, or in short, ETH Zurich. I didn't know that he is also uh, a senior chair, a senior SFI chair, SFI stands for Swiss Financial Institute, a national position. I just learned from him that uh, he got a lot of research money. <coughs> <laughs> <coughs> well, um, prior to joining the ETH Zurich in 1989, he taught at the Imperial College London <coughs> and the University of Limburg in Belgium. His current research interests include <coughs> integrated risk management, securitization of insurance risk, and extremal, extreme value analysis. He has published extensively in the areas of applied probability, <coughs> insurance, and finance, and has co-authored the influential books, Modeling of Extremal Events for Insurance and Finance, <coughs> and Quantitative Risk Management concepts, techniques, and tools. He is on the editorial boards of many scientific journals and serves on many national and international research and academic advisory committees. He also serves as a consultant on issues in quantitative risk management for financial institutions, insurance companies, and international regulatory authorities. Professor Embrex has received many honors and awards which include Honorary Fellowship of the Institute of Actuaries, Actuaries London, Corresponding Membership of the Italian Society of Actuaries, INA International Prize in Mathematics and Insurance of the Accademia Nazionale dei Lincei, <laughs> and Honorary Doctorate of the Universe of Waterloo. This is only a partial list. There are too many. I wouldn't waste his time by reading you through the whole list. So mathematics is a powerful tool for research in finance and risk management. It has brought about a worldwide boom in financial activities. With this current crisis, is it to be blamed? Professor Embrex will give his perspectives on this issue in his lecture, Mathematics and the Financial Crisis. It's now my great pleasure to invite him to deliver his lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Chen. So it's a great pleasure to be here tonight to give this lecture. And indeed, it's a very great pleasure for me and my wife to be again uh, as guests in uh, Singapore. We like it very much, and we uh, very much like our stay at the IMS Institute of Mathematical Sciences. And also, I like it very much that we have a joint cooperation now with the Risk Management Institute, which is just uh, a little walk away, though I know in, in Singapore you normally take buses. <laughs> Anything beyond 50 meters, but... Uh, <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you, but I'm, I'm giving uh, rather many talks in Singapore. It, it's not always... Yeah. And, and so um, it's not clear to what audience I should tell what particular version of the talk. And um, so what I would like to do today is give a very general talk with some aspects of the uh, mathematics and the financial crisis. In some of the other talks I'm giving, uh, I'll enter into some more of the, uh, the technical details. <coughs> so, mathematics and the financial crisis. Um, so this talk is very much for a reference. By the way, if you want to find out some more, some more. Um, um, References, you can always go to my website. So various papers are to be found on there. In particular, 
a paper you find on there is one I just finished and it's on the web since one or two weeks. It's a joint paper with a postdoc of mine, Catherine Donnelly, and it's called The Devil is in the Tales, Actuarial Mathematics and the Subprime Crisis. And you can download it from our website and there you will see more and more information. And it contains also more technical details and indeed all the references to some of the quotes. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a talk with many quotes. Well, mathematics in the financial, in financial crises, you could say, because of course it's not the first time that mathematics has been attacked for having uh, delivered uh, perhaps wrong incentives, wrong tools, whatever, uh, to the financial world. And indeed, uh, I remember around 1987, if you look back at October 19, Black Monday, where the S&P dropped uh, about 23%, uh, we saw in the press discussions on electronic and algorithmic trading, which is a technical field. We saw uh, uh, being attacks on portfolio insurance. Uh, we definitely saw a whole discussion even on, on the use and misuse of value at risk, and indeed to what extent value at risk was creating a sort of herding effect. Then further in 1998, the long-term capital management disaster, there was a lot of discussion afterwards on over-reliance on normal-based risk management systems. And again, value at risk was again, was again. Your mic is close to you. Your mic is close to you. Lower, lower, yeah. Keep it lower. Maybe not that lower, lower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, right, thank you. <laughs> Um, LTCM, of course, again, value at risk was being attacked, normal-based uh, normal based, uh, uh, risk management, the so-called variance, covariance, normality, uh, normality assumptions. <laughs> Leverage was discussed quite a lot. I think I have to go lower. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm now getting hungry, you will hear something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So... I've got a strong voice also, so I can, I can speak loud. Okay, and personalities, of course, were involved. I mean, the, the big Nobel Prizes, uh, Martin Mark, Mark Scholes and, and Robert Merton, of course, so, and, and behind that, quantitative finance. Then, of course, now the 2007 and question marks, because it's not over yet, it's a subprime crisis, and numerous accusations are flying around, and that's the content of the talk today. <clears throat> And indeed, an early victim, let's just take one of them, which was a, a very visible one, was March 14, 2008, Bear Stearns. And here's a picture of Bear Stearns, what happened. And you see at some point, Bear Stearns was trading around $170. Uh, uh, and you see this is around uh, uh, 2006, early 2000, uh, mid-2006. And then you see what happened closer to the time of, of the crisis on March 16, 2009. We saw that... Uh, Bear Stearns were sold for, for two dollars, which is about here, uh, uh, to J.P. Morgan uh, Chase. So we see there's a quite a lot of losses that happened in the market. This is just one case, of course. If you can study whatever happened to Bear Stearns, of course, there were many, many more examples. In the wake of the unfolding subprime crisis, of course, many others were to follow. And indeed, the subprime crisis, we had the whole issue of uh, the, sub, uh, of the uh, uh, mortgage defaults. Here's a little, a little picture where this person just has bought a house. And he says, or she says, I thought we were just buying a house. And you saw that the whole world was basically stacked up on them. Then, of course, an absolutely major disaster, well over a year ago, was uh, Lehman Brothers. I think that's one of the losses that really caused tremendous havoc in the market. And, I think it will still take several years, five up to ten years, I think, to really unravel the positions that, that Lehman Brothers has building up. And of course, also nearer to home, at least nearer to my home, uh, uh, banks like UBS have to look very, very carefully into what they've been doing during the subprime crisis. And of course, behind all these events that happened, of course, we can discuss now what really went wrong and where does mathematics enter? And this is a very, very complicated topic. And indeed, the feeling very much was that of sort of SOS for the world financial system. And I think this is one way of showing it. It's uh, uh, an SOS subprime, uh, SS subprime uh, which is really um, uh, bringing down the financial system. Or one which I like very much, 
uh, it's uh, a bit of an artistic view. I don't know to what extent in Asia it's very well known, but you could call it the scream of the banker. This is, uh, <laughs> this is a famous painting, <laughs> which I think is a, a very nice way of summarizing. Of course, in the back, it's not what Munch uh, drew, but it's called Wall Street and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, the city, etc., etc. Anyhow, for some however, it was clear. Blame the mathematicians. I mean, that was the easy way out. And here are some examples. So this is now getting a bit more into what I would like to discuss with you. Here is one particular uh, announcement that really uh, got a lot of things going against us, and us as the mathematicians. And this is this Wired magazine uh, written by Felix Salmon on the 23rd of February 2009. And I still remember sitting in my office, and I, I didn't know this, this guy, I didn't know this, uh, this, this magazine, but constantly I had new uh, emails arriving on my desk. I said, oh, by the way, did you see this? Did you see that? Did you read this? Did you read that? So everybody was reminding me that I should look at that. <laughs> and indeed, uh, I will let in the talk say a bit more, because it's, if, if there is one formula out there which is blamed for having brought down Wall Street is this formula. And indeed, the statement over there, a recipe for disaster, the formula that brought down Wall Street, well, this is the one. Uh, by, by the way, uh, and, and only for those who haven't heard me ask this question, I will not discuss it, because there's many, many things wrong with this formula, once I've explained it a bit to you, but there's one obvious mistake in the formula. Who sees it? What's the obvious mistake in the formula? Yes, yes, yes. Shall we? I'm missing a right. I'm missing, we're missing a bracket here. <laughs> uh, but believe me, uh, it would have been nice if that would have brought down Wall Street. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> but it's somehow it's, it's a nice twist of, the, of history that, that the guy who's basically saying that we brought down Wall Street is having a little nice mistake in this formula. <laughs> but I, I will, it's clear, I mean, for those who see this for the first time, what does it mean? I have no idea. But I'll, I'll just give you the quotes, and then I'll go into detail in some of the statements. And I said I can give a whole course of these things. But so, but this is this is perhaps the one that attracted most of the attention in the event after this particular uh, Wired magazine. I.e., this is very important. It's the first time I'm personally in my my 30 or 40 years as an academic. Well, not 40 years. Let's say 30, 35 years. Uh, I've been confronted fighting the web web-based communication. Once it's on the web, once it's communicated through the web, we can't get rid of it anymore. It's so omnipresent. And so this is a, a, an incredible example of that. Another, another report that was very important, and, and, and my colleague Hans Felmer very much quoted from that report on today's opening workshop on robust risk measures in portfolio optimization, is uh, uh, we moved to March 2009. Remember, Salmon was uh, 23rd of February. This was uh, 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 the, the, the FSA, the, the British equivalent of your MAS, is the Financial Services Authority, and they're the official regulators. And Lord Turner, as chairman of the committee, was asked to write uh, a, a report, and this is, this is no small report, you see, it's 126 pages, and if you're really interested in, in, in what's going on beyond this particular, this particular um, event, then I can highly recommend you to, to read and at least excerpts from it. And I only have one or two excerpts, and, and you, Hans, in your talk today, you, at some, not in this talk, but I, the, the Nigerian uncertainty discussion is indeed a nice one. But here, for instance, there is this, this, session, this section misplaced reliance on sophisticated mathematics. So here is one of the main regulators in the world who somehow quotes in this one of the statements that mathematics was being misused or misplaced used. But I agree also with Professor Felmer, sorry that I make always the link to his talk, but it's indeed if you read if you read through the document, it's not clear on which side he is standing. On the one hand they are saying, well, Mathematics was being misused, and we have bad, bad techniques there, and all that. But on the other hand, they asked for a better understanding of mathematics. So this is this ambivalence between 
more or less mathematics is, is present in the, in the document. But I think if you read it through, it's clear that he's not on our side. <laughs> and indeed, uh, there's full of statements like the following. Uh, there are, however, fundamental questions about the validity of value at risk as a measure of risk. Now, my colleague, colleague Freddy Del Bago is like always sitting in the back of the room. Uh, <laughs> <it's written. laughs> he wrote a paper very early on in the, in the late, late 90s and wrote to the regulators and had been attacking value at risk from a very applied point of view since the, the birth of value at risk, and, and likewise we did. So it, I don't like to be told now that by the regulator this is a bad risk measure. We've been saying that for a very, very long time. And of course, the, the whole issue of procyclicality uh, is very much mentioned in the report. But it's in the very complexity of the mathematics used to measure and manage risk. Moreover, made it increasingly difficult for top management and boards to assess and exercise judgment over the risk being taken. Mathematical sophistication ended up not containing risk. The next statement I find important, but providing false assurance that other prima facie indicators of increasing risk, rapid credit extension, balance sheet growth, could be safely ignored. I think that's a very important statement. Okay, so that's the second example. Wired Magazine, the form that killed Wall Street, and then the FSA report with many, many more statements of this type. The third one, uh, this is perhaps one that not all of you have seen. Of, uh, this is not about a dancing class, but it's uh, or a kissing class. I it's, uh, it's from the Financial Times. I'm not talking now about Wired Magazine or something small. No, this is the Financial Times. The Financial Times wrote on April 24 this year uh, a, a, a paper on couples and copulas, and I, 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 I will try to make later clear why the, the, the couples are brought together with copulas. <laughs> Be very careful with those words. The story starts as follows, and this could be the, the start of a, of, a, of a Hollywood movie, and I believe it will be a Hollywood movie eventually. In the autumn of 87, the man who would become the world's most influential actor landed in Canada on a flight from China. He could apply the broken hearts mathematics to broken companies. Lee, David Lee, it seemed, had found the final piece of a risk management jigsaw that banks have been slowly piecing together since Quants ever arrived on Wall Street. This article really claims that this particular formula, and by the way, this is a formula, uh, is really like the unifying force of physics. <laughs> and I think we have to make clear this is far away from the truth. Now what I really get, and I will explain this picture to you later, what this has to do with the... Uh, <laughs> by the way, this is, you know, it is just a copy from the Financial Times. I'm not collating things here. Now what really gets me going is why did no one notice the formula's Achilles heel? So we are now not just blamed for brought, they brought bad mathematics into the field, but we're also now blamed for never having told that certain formulae are misused. Now the second one I, I don't take anymore. And so you'll see later by one of my last slides what my reaction was. <coughs> the fourth, so this is the fourth attack on mathematics, out of the many, many, but I think these are more serious. It's now not so long ago, September 12, in the New York Times. And again, this is not just your local newspaper around the corner, this is the New York Times. And there the title again says it all. The title says very clearly, Wall Street's mathematical wizards forgot a few variables. And of course, these variables, or the blindness to these variables, brought down Wall Street. And then I just summarize some words. I don't make quotes, but I think, we should go from three dimensions, starting with mean, variance, for like kurtosis. We should go to n dimensions. We, this, of course, we know that. I mean, we have written papers on saying you can't manage a bank with one number, value at risk. But again, they blame us for really saying, well, you didn't see it in your formula. They stress an important fact that we should look at networks. And I think there will be in the, in the week to come also, I think, discussions. Tomorrow morning, even, I think, like on the sheet on, on networks, I think. Uh, Finance on networks, I think, is a very important mathematical research area. Market psychology, irrationality, human factor. Of course, we know that this is around, and, and we try to, to, to put it into mathematical form. The model uncertainty is a very important aspect. More risk management, less complex products. They very much stress on. 
uh, they talk about new frontiers for French engineering and risk management. Should we rethink our teaching? Should we rethink the way we uh, teach students the field? Uh, more dimension of uncertainty. This is now the same level of discussion we had on, on the, the Turner report when they talk about 19 uncertainty. Uh, what you see other people talk about, well, the efficient market hypothesis, which to some, and that's, I think, a bit of a problem, to, to many out there, the, the power of mathematics is somehow reflected in this one efficient market hypothesis setup. And I think that's a problem we have to fight against. So mathematics is so much more to offer. Now it's called the adaptive market hypothesis. Uh, that's a, um, uh, low, Andy Lowe. Now very much pushes that, but I and understanding of contagion, etc., etc. So we, we forgot many of these components in the formula, according to the to the New York Times. Uh, to the New York Times. So these are four examples, pretty serious accusations. Now an accusation which is perhaps not so explicit, but which in a way cuts much deeper, is coming from the Collège de France. And I still remember sitting in the audience when he mentioned it. Oh, it will come in a minute. <laughs> Sorry, before I, I show that, well, let me show it immediately, and I go back to slide. This is by uh, uh, Roger Kirchnery. He's, as far as I know, the only economics professor, economics economist on the Collège de France. And he said, and I still remember sitting there, but he even said, I can really say it in French, then it sounds even sharper. <laughs> okay, with respect to the current economic crisis, mathematicians are innocent. And this in both meanings of the word. I hope you get the point there, otherwise you translate it in French and listen to it again and then you see it basically say, well, they somehow they have nothing to do with the whole thing. This is an explicit statement of Kisnery. So that, uh, at least we should say, these are serious accusations. And then the summary, in the, I've got one back one, the popular press, these were serious accusations by serious people. You have to from risk-free return to return-free risk, mark the market, mark the bubble, mark to myth, Here's what killed your 401k, the pension fund. I mean, that's a pretty serious accusation. That's in the, the Wired magazine. For those who know Coppola, so I mean, a wonderful statement, I like his mea copula rather than mea culpa. Anything that relies on correlation is charlatanism. Uh, Taleb, now I'm not a friend of Taleb. I hate the black swan, not the bird, but I hate the, the book. Uh, and I can tell you uh, at some point, if you buy me a beer, I can tell you a nice story about that. <laughs> Double defeat for Wall Street and mathematics. Rather than common sense, financial mathematics was ruling, etc., etc. These are statements you can find all over the press, even now just in the local newspaper. So this is serious. So these are real serious allegations. So let us look at some example of financial products and investigate where the mathematics went wrong. And this is now credit derivatives. I said, I mean, this can be applied really throughout the whole field of mathematical finance, financial engineering, quantitative finance, let's just concentrate on what happened right now. <coughs> well, the basic examples, I think, where mathematics is being attacked, and definitely in the Wired magazine, are so-called credit default swaps and CDOs. The credit default swap is an absolutely necessary uh, risk management tool. It's fairly simple in a way. A CDO, is perhaps less necessary, but it's important. It's a collateralized debt obligation. It's a rather complex instrument. Let me just very briefly talk you through a very easy setup of a, of a, of a, of a CDS. A CDS, a credit default swap, let's say you have a pension fund. The pension fund wants to invest money from the people that invested in the fund, that, uh, the, 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 uh, the clients of the fund. The insured. I'm not talking immediately about the, uh, the investor, but the insured. Now, the pension fund knows there's a company here, uh, a company F. That company is double B rated. By whom? By a rating agency. So this is, a, let's say, a company which is a, a not too high profile on the market. It's not double A. It's not triple A. It's double B. Now, the pension fund has money, premium money to invest because it has to, 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 to satisfy guarantees. And the pension fund, <coughs> of course, cannot directly invest into a double B. Because the governors of the fund or, or the local rules, regulators will say, no, no, you cannot go below single A or triple B. So this deal cannot take place. Enters the insurance company. 
I see here. Let's call the insurance company AIG. <laughs> AIG is double A, it was in the early days, triple A rated by the same rating agencies, Moody, Standard & Poor's, whoever, Fitch, these other three. Now, they come up with a, with a, a deal. So, pension fund one, even gives one million dollars to the B, to the, the fund company F, and let's say it gets a 10 year return on that, that's not bad, 10% return on that. Now, the AIG, the insurance company, now covers the loss, the default loss that may happen to F on the loan from the pension fund. And now suddenly, regulatory-wise, the fallout of B is now covered by a double-A company. And of course it costs money, so the money would be now, let's say, 1% uh, a year. It's like an insurance product. And of course, there are quite a few of these products around. And I say a bit what I mean by few. Now this is only the beginning. There can be 10, 20, 30 or more such deals on the head of of this company F. There can be more insurance companies involved. AIG was a very big player in the paper with Catherine. We go very much in detail because it's more insurance related into what happened to AIG. So if you're interested in the insurance background, read my paper with Catherine Donnelly. Now this is not ending up. Here I can, you can still say, well, there's economic need in such a structure. It's like an insurance, a financial insurance. But now enter the hedge funds. They're here. The hedge fund is not at all interested in this company. They're only interested in the default probability of that company. Now, if that, have, that company says, well, in our mind, it's not a double B. We think either it's a single B with a higher default risk. Our internal models have made that clear, mathematics enters. Then they will go to AIG, who believes it's a double B, say, and they will just bid on this company. So now we have pure bidding going on. And of course, there can be many, many hedge funds. And I'm not saying, per se, that kind of structure is wrong. I'm just saying, you should be aware of what the, in, the implications are. I, first of all, how do you price this risk here? And secondly, somebody should be aware of the interconnectivity in that market. Because where do I get problems if suddenly several of these double B companies or like go broke because of, for instance, an economic downturn. That's exactly what happened. Because then suddenly, all these, comp all these, these uh, uh, funds, like, the, the, like the, the, this pension fund and other investors, investors uh, in this company F, will call upon AIG to repay uh, the loan. Then suddenly, AIG will have a problem with the rating agencies. Because they will say, well, that's not double A anymore. It will be good now. And then, of course, it's uh, in Germany, it's uh, happened once. I mean, this is sort of a spiral staircase downwards. Okay? That's what happened. The next product is a CDO. Now, this is much more complicated, and you don't have to read this a CDO. But let me just say that the CDO is something like the modern finance way of turning iron into gold. You start with a homeowner somewhere, let's say, in California, Mr. Mrs. Smith. A broker enters, he says, okay, we have these teaser loans for you. We know your, your financial situation is not all that bad. We give you a teaser loan that's fairly constant for a, two, three years. But then, of course, it goes up. That's not a problem because housing prices always have been going up in the United States. So it's a sure thing. You, we can adjust later. You have, we can get more. We can get a higher loan and all that. It's absolutely no problem. These are collected into a, through an investment bank, a so-called special purpose vehicle, so there's a legal construction taking place here that takes the risks, bring them together, that's called warehousing. If you're a bank and you put risks on your balance sheet, that's like a warehouse. You carry the risk of what's on your balance sheet. With a special purpose vehicle, with securitization, that's the magic word, you are able to take away some of that risk. In many cases, they try to get rid of all the risks off your balance sheet. And you get regulatory re capital relief. That's where the CDOs entered. And what finally took place in the CDOs was this, this so-called tranche. So what was happening on the left-hand side, on the asset side, a whole set of loans, for instance, came in. 
from subprime to prime loans, they were securitized, sliced in pieces, passed on to a complex legal system, and then they were somehow packed together in something called the equity tranche, the mezzanine tranche, and the senior tranche. And now you have a waterfall system. The water in this case runs from bottom to top. The first losses are borne by the, let's see, the high risk equity tranche. That you would expect the banks to keep on their balance sheet. As far as I know, they also try to get rid of that. Get rid of all the risk. Then in the middle came the mezzanine tranche. That, board, that was bearing the second, the second lot of risks well defined because a typical document was about a thousand pages. And then finally you come to this magical triple A layer, which by the way is close to 80%, where the last couple of losses that could have been produced according to a loss model in your asset side were made into liabilities on the right hand side. Now here the regulators, the, the, the rating agencies played a role. Because how did they make it triple A? They put the loss model on this, let's say a distribution function, let's say with a peak here, typically, very often a normal distribution, by the way, that gave very little probability of losses being produced by the asset side in this uh, senior layer. And this would then, let's say, this layer would then, according to the model, mathematical model, the Lee model in the end, would have, let's say, a 0.0% yearly loss probability. That's AAA. Now, AAA, you all want to have. That's close to risk-free. And by the way, there were super senior tranches, which was believe, were believed to really be totally free. The amazing thing is they still had return. Now, if there's one thing you learn from mathematics, there is no, <coughs> no return without risk. But here it was believed. And so the, the whole thing, and this will be a completely different talk, I might say something about that. I'm giving a lunchtime talk later in the week, but how you construct loss models over this layer, because it's very much what probability do you give to certain losses in these tranches that determines completely the payout. All right? So this is now what the CDO was. And, and by the way, a synthetic CDO is a CDO where on the asset side, we are not talking about loans, but on the asset side, the input is the payment stream coming from CDSs, credit default swaps. So many, many credit default swaps. What's a CDO square? A CDO square. The difficult tranches to price are the mezzanine tranches, the middle tranches. Because here you have a better, a better modeling, well at least you either modeling the tail or completely the beginning of your loss distribution. The mezzanine tranches are very difficult to price. Well, let's tranche them. So now you take the mezzanine tranche the CDOs, you walk to here, you put them into the asset side, and you tranche them. Of course they will have equity, uh, mezzanine, senior. Well, if you still, if you can't sell them, take the mezzanine out, go here, and you have a CDO cube. Now, if you can model a CDO cube, congratulations, I have absolutely no idea. It's totally dependent on the models you're using. There's model uncertainty all over the place. By the way, you could question what's the, well, you could not question. It's nonsense. It's economic nonsense, CDO cubes. Okay. So I think you agree with me after this very short introduction, I'm very much sorry I cannot go more into detail here, that the whole system is full of complexity. Opacity was ruling. Opacity meaning nobody really saw through the whole scheme, especially not me. I'm here the investor in one of these tranches. Distance, distance from originator to investor. Greed, these markets were growing extremely fast. I'll give you an idea later. Economic and political stupidity. Why did these markets grow? Because of regulatory frameworks and because of low interest rate situation after September 11, for instance. That was one of the reasons. And then politicians in the US, not just the US, phoning up and saying, by the way, you should give in my constituency in, in let's say, Southern California, you should give these loans. Uh, regulatory blindness, I think we have to face it. Academic naivety, I think we're all to blame for certain naivety in this whole construction. I'll show you which one and arrogance. I think we're all to blame. So I think it's not a question is mathematics to blame. It's also not a question from we, we wash our hands in innocence. I think we are part of that game. If we teach perhaps some mathematics, we should be aware of some of these important products going on. Now, if this is a product where the total amount to be sold was about 100 million, 
or 50 million, or even 1 billion, so what? But that's not the case. So before we say something about pricing, let us reflect about volume. <coughs> I remember I was 11 years on the board of a big bank, that did okay in the crisis, Julius Baer. And I remember about five years ago, or six years ago, um, a private banker came up to me after a board meeting and he said to me, well, first of all, worldwide you've noticed that the global risk measured by value at risk has been going down. So the thing has become safer with the wrong glasses, with the VAR glasses on. But where is all the credit risk hiding, he asked me. Of course, I didn't understand really the question because I was not really looking at data there. But they were very well aware that a lot of credit risk was staying off balance it was not showing up anymore. I can tell you what happened, how they came on balance again, or why a bank like UBS happened. Well, there were some kickbacks between the SPVs and the banks, but that's now a different story. So in particular, what order of magnitude are we talking about for these markets? Now here comes a horror slide. I can challenge you, can you immediately say what this number is? Well, it's a big number. And you can take Singapore dollar, US dollar, I don't care about the dollar sign. The credit default swap market is always a brand new investment vehicle, but the markets are in 20 times its size in 2000. The principal amount of the principal amount, nominal amount of outstanding equals 50 trillion US dollar. Now let's be careful. I don't know what the Singaporean trillion is, but there's a difference between the UK and the US. Even there's a difference between the Germans and the French. A trillion for me is 10 to the power 12. Okay, 50 times 10 to the power 12 dollar nominal value outstanding. That's a huge market. By the way, you can say, well, but that's nominal. You can net it, you can make it the net amount. It's still four trillion. That's sizable. Now, how big is that? That's three times the US GDP. More importantly, that's basically the world's GDP. The world GDP, give or take, is about 60 trillion US dollar. These are products which are traded off balance. These are pro uh, off, off, well, balanced partly, but these are products that are not traded on a, on, a, on a regulated market, over the counter. That means we don't really know exactly. Of course, we know to some extent it's possible to find out, but it's not like this is traded like an like, uh, equity on the, on the stock market. <coughs> and I'm not saying that the market went wrong there, but it's, it's a fact. And so how many of these OTC derivatives are there normally, roughly? Well, about 550 trillion. That's about eight, nine times the world GDP. So if we now talk about pricing some of these products, even with this, if it's four trillion after netting, we better think very carefully about model uncertainty, which I prefer over the word model risk, because model risk is too quickly coming after market risk, credit risk, operational risk regulatory capital. It's model uncertainty. I think I agree with you, Hans, there. I think that's the area of research and teaching we have to concentrate on. And it has numerous facets in the area of risk measures, in the area of the non-normal world, in portfolio analysis, I think, in, in, behavioral, in behavioral science. I think model uncertainty, that's, I think, a playground where we really have to contribute. So this is a huge amount of money. And yet, let's see what the regulators say. Well, this is not a regulator. This is the IMF, Global Financial Stability Report, who has all the information. April 2006. Let's read it together. There's a growing recognition that the dispersion of <coughs> credit risks by bank to a broader and more diverse group of investors, rather than warehousing, rather than keeping it on board, such risk on their balance sheets, i.e. we shifted away, has helped make the banking and overall financial system more resilient. The improved resilience may be seen in fewer bank failures and more consistent print provision. Consequently, the commercial banks may be less vulnerable today, end of 2006, to credit or economic shocks. Well, it's difficult to get it more wrong. <laughs> And this is a, this is a well-informed, but this is just the mood of the day. We really thought that securitization was the key to passing on these risks. This very much clashed with an older view. 
And I've got some people have kept on earlier talk of me this week, I've, and you've seen this, but let me repeat it. I think it's really, it's really good to look at it again. So I, 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 it's not a quiz. I could make it a quiz. And not for those who heard my earlier talk this week. Yeah. I didn't give this talk, but part of it. I went, this is a person in the background. It would be nice if you could guess who it is. I went to explain how securitization can give rise to perverse incentives. Has the growth in securitization look at the enormous growth in CDOs, being result of more efficient transaction technologies or an unfounded reduction in concern about the importance of screening loan applications. And you can put loan in very general terms. We should at least entertain the possibility that is the latter, i.e. that institutions were not carefully checking the money they were lending out to subprimes. Rather than believing we have this magical tool securitization, which makes it unnecessary to do so, because we can shape the bottle in a way that we can really separate or we can mix or whatever. That's a form of an important statement. Now this person continues. At the very least, I really like this. At the very least, the banks have demonstrated an ignorance of two very basic aspects of risk: the importance of correlation and the importance of a price decline. Now, anybody has an idea who wrote this? Or, and by the way, it's not written yesterday. This is written in 1992 by somebody you know all. It's by Joseph Stiglitz. Oh. Stiglitz wrote this quote in 1992. Here is the reference. You can look at it later. Uh, or you can, you can, you can just, uh, you can just Google him. But this is one of the most fundamental. I mean, at least one of the most <coughs> fundamental economists. I, at least I know Nobel Prize, but that's not good enough. And he made this statement in '92. So, who are we then to say again and repeat and repeat and repeat? Now, of course, this last statement here is very dear to my heart because it is very much close to what I think is important as research. And I'm not saying everybody has to do this, but that's at least my research, my research agenda. At least from Stiglitz 1992, we learned two things are important to model. In the whole world of financial mathematics, insurance mathematics, namely looking at the downside risk, i.e. looking at extremes. Now, I can talk about extremes in every possible context. It's, it can be one-dimensional extremes, it can be extremes independent. There are many ways you can look at extremes. I'm not just talking about a non-normal model or non-Gaussian model. There are many ways into which extremes come. Implicitly, beyond the normal world, for instance, that you say, well, we use uh, a sharp ratio. Well, sharp ratio is very much a, 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 a model from the normal world, at least the classical thinking of the normal world. And indeed, correlation, which I would like to extend to dependence. <coughs> and now, a little, a little advertisement. <coughs> Uh, together with two of my colleagues, uh, Alexander McNeil and Rudiger Frey, he's now in Edinburgh, he's in, in uh, Leipzig. We wrote a book uh, in 2005, we contained 10 chapters. Two of the chapters are exactly on that topic. Because we were very much aware, when we started writing early 2000s, that these are absolutely key fields, and we come up with more actuarial side. And so we have a chapter on the mathematical chapter, we program everything we discuss into software, S plus or R software, on extreme value theory. What do we mean by the non-normal world in its various guises? And we have a chapter on dependence modeling beyond linear correlation. Again, again linear correlation is very much uh, a, correla a concept from the world of, uh, of normality, at least our initial interpretation of it. And there's much more in the book, which you can find out if you like. So the societal, now I, I borrowed, I told Professor Fulmer I will borrow some of his statements and I've translated from German to English. Uh, because I, oh, okay. The overall societal relevance, importance and success of mathematics is without doubt. It's not yet from your, your line, but I think, I think this is without discussion. I think some examples which I just wrote down you can think of medical statistics and epidemiology. I think one of the very early beautiful ways of seeing how mathematics can help is how in, in the old London uh, the infectious diseases were statistically discovered and, 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 and by looking at wells and drinking water 
uh, statistical proof gave a lead to how to improve the people's health. Statistical quality control in Asia, I don't have to discuss this. Maxwell theory of electromagnetism, I think, is a wonderful example of how fundamental mathematics enters. Calculus and Newtonian mechanics. Number theory and cryptography. We just were walking through the, uh, the, the nano lab or uh, uh, quantum cryptography. And there's a lot of mathematics there. Differential geometry in ice size relativity. A nice application to GPS. I think you need even general relativity to get the GPS up to a couple of meters. Something that perhaps fewer of you know, but really one of the nicest examples of current mathematical use is in search engines like Google, where you use Markov chain theory in Frobenius theorem, where you look at your websites as very huge, very huge uh, transition matrices from one website to another, sparse matrices, numerics, beautiful mathematics. It made the difference when Google came to the market. Many of you were not, well, I think you were all born then, but I still remember the old, the old Google, the old machine, and suddenly this Google made it. Well, they had one, one of them was a mathematician, an ADFL engineer, all of them from Stanford. And they used Markov chain theory. So I think, in, in many examples, so we don't have to discuss the relevance of mathematics and its societal importance. Now I go to Hans Felber, where he correctly said that mathematical finance, financial mathematics, we will never agree what's the right word. And then <laughs> we may settle this week what we should do, but I don't think we will. Uh, it's of key importance, A, understanding and clarifying models used in economics. Making heuristic methods mathematically precise. Highlighting model conditions and restrictions on applicability. So, okay, this model, let's say the Lee model, you can apply there, but you cannot apply it there. Why? Because the conditions don't hold. Working over numerous explicit examples. Leading the way for stress testing and robustness properties, and this is exactly what we are now discussing this week at the IMS and the Risk Management Institute. And indeed, it's a beautiful, relevant theory on its own. So we can just close our door, pretend the world out there doesn't exist, and just enjoy the mathematics, which is fine. <laughs> if only we occasionally open the window to get some fresh air in, and not just set the cooling system on. Mathematics in the, in the crisis, I'm going to the last part of my talk now. An example. Well, remember here I started. Okay, that's the Wired magazine. Let's now explain the formula. This is the Gaussian copula. And I know this animal very well because I reintroduced copulas in 1997. So I basically blew up Wall Street, I think. <laughs> the reason was, and you should look at the paper again, to warn the misuse of correlation not to say you have to use copulas. I always said a thousand times, I can't hear myself anymore, there are three reasons why copulas are important. Pedagogic, pedagogic, stress testing. I never said pricing or hedging. And I know beautiful examples where it has been used, and even where companies use copula thinking, if you know copulas, for shying away from the CDO tranches. Okay, so it can be used very effectively in, 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 in I can give you all this energy. So what, what is the reason? What is now the background of the Lee formula? Well, we now look at, at, remember, where did we have a problem with CDSs and hence CDOs when suddenly a whole number of companies default on us? Because then I really have a big trouble. And now Lee came up with a very nice idea. The lifetime of, the, the, the time to default of a company is like the lifetime of a patient. If I die, it's like a company going default, okay? So you can borrow now mathematics from the world of actuarial science that models so-called joint survivorship. And medical statistics is full of that. Very nicely applied. And so now you see, now you already understand the first part here. This is the probability, it's not my notation, I'm sorry. The probability that company A defaults by the end of the year and company B defaults by the end of the year. So I have a joint default, of course I can write. This is just from the Wired magazine. And now here's this magical formula. This is the copula. I can only say briefly to you, I have no time to go into detail. This phi 2 is our good old friend, the bivariate Gaussian. The bivariate Gaussian is a gamma. I would call it rho. He called it gamma. That's a correlation in the bivariate gamma. Now, now we transform the marginals to normality. You see here, this is a survival time at one. That's a number between zero and one. The inverse Gauss, 
Kakete, the standard Gaussian, can map that back onto the real line here also. So this is a well-defined mathematical formula. It is a formula that if A and B, so what is the natural survival time if I look at these lamps, for instance? Well, let's say the exponential distribution or the gamma distribution. So the copula are very useful if you have marginal distributions which are non-standard, a gamma and a log normal, and you want to find a bivariate model. There is no nice bivariate model out there. So you can find infinitely many of them using the concept of copula. And then you really have to understand what you're doing. So here is one where the marginals say are gamma, <coughs> and the dependence comes from the bivariate Gaussian. More I cannot say. By the way, where does Johnny Cash and June Carter? This is June Carter. They sadly died very short. And this is the broken heart syndrome now, because they said, I got the model, um, uh, Lee, from uh, the broken heart syndrome. If people are married at later age, one of them dies, then typically the other one dies earlier than you would normally expect in, in the normal case control, etc. So this is the broken heart syndrome. People miss each other. It happened to June Carter and, and, and Johnny Cash. That's your that's in financial times. What I really opposed to is why did no one notice the problem in that formula? Well, you could say, well, I'm not talking about this bracket, believe me. <laughs> what is the problem with this formula? Well, normality stares you in the face all over the place. Very explicitly by very normal. Here that's less important. That's just to get the marginals right. This correlation, that's normal thinking. Which correlation are we talking about? Well, we did warn, believe me, very explicitly, many occasions, and even when I gave my first talk in New York, David Lee was in my audience, when I showed him the, the following paper. And you can go to my website. I think it's still one of the nicest papers, pedagogical papers, also scientific papers I've written, together with Daniel Strom and Alex McNeil. We wrote a paper in 98, Risk Club Report, Correlation Dependency in Risk Management, Properties and Pitfalls, where we warned about 50 pages how wrong you can be in finance and insurance with wrong correlation in thinking. The next picture I show, and in that paper, well, let me first show the next picture, and then I go back to this remark too. This is from the paper. Here I show two markets. Let's say this is a standard model, this is a stress model. Now believe me, if you look at that picture with my glasses, at the dots, at the simulation, you don't see a difference. These are identical pictures. If you look at marginals and correlation, they both have gamma 3, 1 marginals, in both direction, and they both have 70% linear correlation. So if your pricing system only is driven by linear correlation and marginals, which so often is the case, very often implicitly, then these are the two ex exactly the same markets. Now there is a big difference. In the original model, you see there's only three losses here in this simulation. In this model, the stress model I call, I've got 12 of losses. So, and if a loss means joint defaults for my underlying credit portfolio, and in higher dimensions also, then here I have a big problem if I put the same price. The price is basically determined by marginals and correlation. I'm oversimplified, but this, paper, this, this picture was in the talk. Much more importantly, remark two was in the paper, and remember, the guys from risk metrics who were just working on the formula were in the audience and I discussed during the break with them. And so they saw this theorem. Now this theorem tells the following. The Gaussian copula, which is this phi 2, gives asymptotic independence provided in their notation gamma is less than 1. How strongly you put this input parameter, 99.99999% in your bivariate Gaussian, your joint defaults from that formula here will occur independently in the tails, will occur like in this case here. And if I move up, that corner will become empty. Not in this case, by the way. And this is a theorem by Shibuya. It's 1960, this is due to the way the Japanese accounting year works, but never mind. So he proved that, that in a very precise mathematical statement, this is extreme value theory, if we go far enough in the tail, extreme events appear to occur independently in each margin. It has a fact. It's a mathematical fact, and, and it's as close a mathematical fact that is useful in practice. And what you see, hence what you see here, is what I can prove. If you move this corner more and more up, 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 you basically will not see much, much happening in these tails. 
Now this is a, a, a stress model, this is a gamble model, and this is exactly what some companies have used, such a model, to stress test the portfolio of so-called AAA rated senior tranche. And they say, no way we can make AAA with such a model from the subprimes. And they did not invest. I can give you names and addresses if you like. So I have many more examples where early warnings by academics were dismissed as that academic or we know what we are doing. Just before coming here with my, my colleague Fred Delbaum, we discussed some reactions in industry. How they discussed certain or, or dismissed certain academic warnings. And I can give you much more explicit warnings. We, both Freddie and myself independently wrote documents to the Basel Committee warning against VAR and uh, over reliance on some of the models. And there were many more people also at the, at the workshop. I will say a bit more about that on Wednesday at Risk Management Institute. Well, the research I've been doing out of there, I think it's clear what we've done, is modeling on extreme events, QRM, and a much more mathematical book. It's a geometric approach to high risk scenarios and extremes, multiple extremes. I think there's beautiful mathematics coming out of that, but that will be a talk I will be giving on at the workshop on Friday. Some comment the last three or four slides, please. I, I could use my own words, but these are words that uh, a very much a high regard a colleague of ours, Chris Rogers from Cambridge, wrote down, and I, they completely summarize what I mean in this world, and not just these, a couple of examples. The problem is not that mathematics was used by the banking industry, it was a problem that was abused by the banking industry. Grants were, instru bonds were instructed to build models which fitted the market prices, the famous calibration. Now, if the market prices were way out of line, macroeconomically, for instance, I said, okay, well, it's impossible that, that, that these house prices for macroeconomic reasons will keep on growing. The calibrated models, this is his famous word, would just faithfully reproduce those wacky values. And the bad prices get reinforced by an overlay of scientific respectability. And that's exactly the statement, by the way, that also that Turner took over to some extent. The standard models were used for a long time before rightfully discredited, and I know Chris Rogers is talking here about the Lee model, by some academics, but only, I must be clear here, only some, I think. Uh, and the more thoughtful practitioners, also only some, <coughs> were from a start complete fudge. So you had garbage prices being underpinned by garbage public, and Mark Davis very much doubles. The whole industry was stuck into a classic positive feedback loop, which no party could walk away from. Well, I, I stress that we wanted to walk away from it. This is a serious problem we have on the behavioral side, and I just don't know how to solve that. That's where greed, that's where regulatory bonuses come in. Well, I finally felt that I had to react. And I've, the finally is after I read the, 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 financial, the financial Times paper. Remember, the Financial Times had a very big statement in the bottom. Why did nobody see the Achilles heel of the, the Gaussian Coppola model? And so I, I've been there from the start. And believe me, I've many times mentioned that to many people not just academically, but also regulatory wise. So I finally had to react. So I wrote a letter to the Financial Times. <laughs> Dear sir, the article of Couples and Copulas published on 24 April 2009 suggests that Davis Lee formula is to blame for the current financial crisis. For me, this is the same as blaming Einstein's his E is MC square formula for the destruction wrecked by the atomic bomb. <laughs> Feeling like a risk manager whose protestations of imminent danger were ignored, and there were several risk managers, I wish to make clear that many well-respected academics, several in the audience here, have pointed out the limitations of the mathematical tools used in the financial industry, including this formula. But this is just a tiny example. I think that the importance of that formula has been However, these warnings were either ignored or dismissed with the desultory response, it's academic. We hope it will listen to in the future rather than being made as a convenient scapegoat. <laughs> well, they didn't publish it. <laughs> <laughs> More on this topic I will tell you coming Wednesday. Uh, it's November 18, there will be a talk at the RMI Lunch and Talk series. You have to register. Uh, I, I, it's called the, the financial crisis, a question of guilt. I will go into detail of some of the accusations I've made and some of the models I've made and, and talk a bit about more extremes. Uh, uh, so, but I should not, uh, uh, I think I would now like to end with uh, a picture. I would like to thank you. By the way, that's my wife. She's sitting in the back row somewhere. Hemda, where are you? Can you stand up? Is she here?
if I would have had a, a, a bottle of Belgian beer, I could give a price. So where is this photograph taken? It was taken on Sunday. Well, you know. <laughs> Botanic Garden. It's one of the photo spots. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.